All right, there will be people joining us um, all throughout over the next few minutes or so as some folks are finishing up sessions at their schools. But for the about 100 or so of the folks that are on, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Really excited to have this session today. Um, for those of you who I haven't met, my name is Joey LaRoche. I'm the Chief Strategy Officer here at KIPP New Orleans. Um, we are thrilled to be joined by the city's doctor, our director of the New Orleans Health Department, Dr. Jennifer Abegno. Um, really appreciate her being with us today, as you know, and have heard from the press conferences. She is a practicing physician, actively on the front lines fighting coronavirus and helping to keep us all safe as well um, with the entire city team. We have consulted with Dr. Begno really since the beginning of this as we were going through navigating school last year. And through her um, advice and some of the work she did with us, it is how we were able to operate school last year, um, both in person and virtual learning and stay safe. We did not have transmission across our schools and we're very proud of that through all of the layered defenses that we had. And now we have so many of our um, staff who are getting vaccinated. We're at about 75% right now as a staff um, and our students were moving on, as you can see. Um, for those of you who are at Team Douglas, you are at 97% vaccinated as a staff, which is really great news. Um, we know that we're going to learn today more about why that's the best defense for us. Um, and then students, they had about 145 um, students and families last week at their event who got vaccinated. Yesterday, you might have seen on our news reports that um, on a lot of the different news outlets that JFK's football team, the entire football team got vaccinated yesterday. Um, as you know, we are all also back to masks in person, um, indoors, which are the recommendations, and that will be true for our students as well. And there's so much that has changed even over the last two days or new information that has come out. So Dr. Begno is here to help us make sense of it. Throughout the chat, throughout the session, um, you can chat to me or to um, James, if you have any questions, I'm probably the best one to get it to because I will be filtering it after. But if you get it to James, no problem. He'll get it over to me. Um, and then at the end of the time that Dr. Begno spends talking to us, she will be open for some questions from the group that I will um, just share out and sort of keep track of for you. So you can just chat me if you have any of those. So um, folks will be coming in. So please just remember to mute um, just in case something um, happens. You can have cameras on or off, whatever is better for you. But Dr. Vegno is going to get started. So Dr. Vegno, thank you so much for being here. We can unmute you. There we go. Okay. How's that? All right. Great. Um, thank you, Joey. Thank you, everyone, for having me here. I I'm really really grateful for the opportunity. Um, I know you all are probably tired of hearing about COVID and, you know, guess what? So am I. Um, but this is a war that's not over yet. And so I appreciate the opportunity to be able to update you on everything we know. I'm, I'm glad it was today because the CDC came out with some really important information that helps us understand what's going on right now um, even more. And so I'm going to present that to you as well. I don't have a PowerPoint. Y'all know if you watch me on the press conferences, I love my PowerPoints, but um, I don't have one today. So I'm hoping this can be a conversation. I have some of your questions here. I'm going to try to touch through them, but I'm just going to sort of brief you on where we've been, where we are, um, and then we can get into anything that I didn't cover. So, you know, we've been at it for, I don't know, close to 17 months now. Um, I will say it took us months, if not a full year, to really understand COVID in its original form, that original coronavirus that came, that swept over our city so, you know, in such a devastating way. Um, in many ways, New Orleans learned lessons very early, which was a, a blessing, um, if you want to look at a silver lining, because we were able to take the measures that worked to keep us safe until there were vaccines in a way that most other places did not. You know, if you look at our initial surge, obviously it was horrific. Um, and it happened when we had no idea what was hitting us um, until it hit us. But because I think it had such a big effect on us, you know, New Orleanians didn't fight when we said, put on a mask. They didn't complain when we said, everybody stay home because they knew the worst that could happen. When you look at what our, our cases, our hospitalizations, our death rates were after that surge, they were much lower than the rest of the state and much lower than the rest of the country. And that is something that every one of us can be proud of. And thank you all for really, really sticking to that. Um, and so, you know, I think we all believed that we would be in the clear, uh, you know, not too long after the vaccines came in. But what viruses do when they are given 
a completely naive population, 8 billion people worldwide to infect, is that they change and they try to outsmart everything that we throw at them. And that's unfortunately what we're seeing now. The same things that have protected us in the first wave are going to protect us in the sec second wave if we can all do it. And that's really masking, protecting our vulnerable residents, so not going around those who are vulnerable, and the vaccine. The vaccines truly are miraculous. They're not everything. They don't do 100% because of course nothing does. But the fact that we have three highly effective vaccines in a very short time frame that were solidly developed, have all the science behind them and are working is really a miracle. And I wanna thank the 75% of you all who have taken advantage of them. And I wanna really, really reiterate, you know, give you some reasons why the rest of you should. Um, what the vaccines do is not prevent you from ever being exposed or ever getting the disease, right? None of them do that, but they allow your body to build up immunity so that when you are shown the disease, it can fight it off much quicker and you are much better for it. What we know now is that even with this new variant, and I'll talk about why Delta is different and, and a lot scarier, the vast majority of people who are very sick right now with COVID have not received their vaccine. So that is 90% plus of people in Louisiana in a hospital or who have died never got a vaccine, which is a, just an utter tragedy because they would have lived. The people that we're seeing who are vaccinated and still very sick are those that were always at highest risk. There are older folks, there are um, people with immune compromised you know, conditions like cancer, chemo, other conditions. That's a tragedy as well, because the vaccine is doing as best as it can for them, but we need to protect ourselves and not give the virus a chance to spread to them. So it is still true more than ever that if you have the vaccine, you are overwhelmingly protected from the worst of Delta. And when I tell you it's the worst, it is the worst. What we're seeing now is those people who are getting very sick, are younger, they're healthy, and they deteriorate very, very quickly. That's our young people who could have got a vaccine, but I really wanna highlight that there are children who cannot yet get a vaccine. And I, all of you all have seen recent news stories about how children's hospitals are full, particularly ours at Children's, with kids who can't be vaccinated yet who have COVID, some of whom have died. So this is really life or death. So why, why is this happening to us now, right? New Orleans, I am so proud to say, is one of the best vaccinated cities like us in the country. We are over 71% of our adults have gotten at least one vaccine. It's 70% of our 12 year olds and above, over 80% of our seniors have gotten it. We're really doing incredibly well. The problem is the rest of the state is nowhere near that. And, and in many other states, there were huge pockets of places where people just aren't protected. So what did the vaccine do? Or what did the virus do, excuse me? It changed from that original type to the alpha variant, which was the one that started in the UK, to the delta variant, which started in India. Why did it probably start in India? Because very few people in India are vaccinated, and there's an awful lot of people there to spread it to. It inevitably, of course, came here. Delta has a change, a mutation in a part of it, the little spiky proteins that come off of the virus itself that help it get into the cells easier and faster. So we knew when we started to see it that it was more infectious because it has an easier time of getting into your cells. And when viruses get into your cells, all they wanna do is make copies of themselves. Delta appears to make copies of itself much, much faster than the original type. So when you are exposed to it, it you are then infectious to other people, if you're unvaccinated, very quickly. 
You don't have a few days of it building up virus, right? And then you can transmit it to other people a lot easier because there's a lot more virus hanging out in your nose and throat, especially if you're not vaccinated. What the CDC released yesterday was a comparison of the Delta variant to the original and to other disease. What we know is that the Delta strain of the virus is more contagious than Ebola, than smallpox, than uh, uh, polio, than a lot of other really, really scary viruses. And we know it spreads like chickenpox. Now, if y'all are as old as I am, you know that when one kid in your family got chicken pox, you all had it pretty immediately. That's what we're talking about, how fast Delta spreads. That is why we have seen the explosive growth over the last month. So at the beginning of July, we were averaging about 11 cases a day. Not a big, not a big deal whatsoever. Now it's over 200, and that's in a month. Again, the vast majority of the cases that we're seeing with symptoms are people who are not yet vaccinated. But I know a lot of you know people who are vaccinated who are testing positive. I bet though, you don't know very many of them who are in the hospital right now. And that's because the vaccines are working. But because it is so widespread and because it spreads so much more quickly, we've got to take measures in addition to waiting for everyone to get the vaccine, right? Because remember, even if everybody woke up today and said, you know what, I'm ready, I'm gonna get it, it would be a full six weeks before the immunity would build up after the two shots. So we're back to masking. Masking is and always has been and will remain to be a very effective way to cut down on the transmission of the virus. It is not 100%, might not even be 80%, but it protects both you and someone else if you're both wearing a mask. That's why you saw the American Academy of Pediatrics and the CDC both come out and recommend universal masking when you're indoors because we need everything we can to just stop the cycles of transmission to get our levels back to what they were for a very long time in the summer. You know, I fully believe that the CDC should not have removed the indoor masking um, rule when it did. We asked them not to, we told them that we needed more time. They did, um, and I understand why they did, because when they looked at the rest of, when they looked at the country as a whole, they thought we're gonna be okay. They really didn't know what Delta had in store for us. So I'm incredibly grateful that NOLA Public Schools, as soon as AAP came out with it, said, we are gonna do this to protect ourselves. Um, I think that this is the best thing we can do both masking and vaccinations, if we can get to 100% vaccinations or close to among all of our staff, among all of our kids that can be vaccinated, and we wear masks to weather this storm through the first weeks to months or however long Delta is going to be with it, I think that that will make for a very successful school year. I'm a mom. I have four kids. I watched them all struggle last year with virtual learning. Some of them were in virtual learning for over six months. Some of them went back um, even quickly because I had four different schools. Um, one of the questions I saw was, you know, why does the American Academy of Pediatrics and public health organizations, why does everybody say in-person is better? What we learned last year from COVID is that if everyone's wearing masks as they were last year, even without the vaccine, the risk of transmission in a school, so a kid sitting in a desk and another kid sitting in a desk or a teacher sitting at the front of the classroom or wherever you might be, that was incredibly rare. When And, and many of you probably lived this. When kids and teachers got infected last year, it was almost never because it happened in school. It was because of the softball game or the birthday party or the going out to dinner or something in the personal sphere. With Delta being, Delta is more contagious, we know that, but the masks still work. And now we have the vaccine. We do know that vaccinated people 
do not give Delta to each other as much as unvaccinated people. They still can, but their body is so good at fighting it off that there's not as much to infect. So that's why everybody's wearing masks. But again, it's that masking plus vaccination. You all are educators. I don't, you know, you probably know better than I do what happens when you lose those kids online. I, I, got, I am so grateful for all of you. I do not know how you did it last year, how you balanced trying to make sure, especially if you had a class full of kindergartners or whatever the age group, they were engaged, they were learning, they were progressing. Um, it's near impossible. And I, speak, I say that watching my own children do it. I, I am very worried about the learning losses that we have. I also know that the social and emotional benefits, and, and this is what public health folks talk about a lot, of being in school, of being in a community, of learning how to function are almost just as important as some of the academic things that they require. As many of you know, the services that are provided in school did not happen outside of school in many cases. And I have a, I have a child with special needs and I am incredibly grateful for the services that are provided through a school. It's not the same. And then you all are our, you know, our first responders. You see the kids who are struggling, um, who have signs of abuse, who need extra help. If they're not coming to you, you're not seeing them on Zoom. So the preponderance of evidence over the last year is pretty strong that in-person learning with mitigation is far better overall than back to virtual learning. Obviously there are kids who don't fall into that category, right? Um, my daughter's, one of her best friends has sickle cell disease. And, you know, maybe for her that's being in school while younger kids can't get vaccinated and while our rates are, are not, you know, a hundred percent, maybe that's not the right thing. And, and I know you all are making um, accommodations for that. But for the average kid who does not have those specific challenges, you know, even now, we still believe that it's the most important thing to be in school. I will say that might change. Delta has really, really thrown us all for a loop. Um, again, in New Orleans, we, we, we're starting out at a better place because we are so highly vaccinated. Um, but, you know, we know that what could be coming after Delta is worse. And again, that's the danger is if, if Delta keeps spreading, eventually it's going to get a mutation that's going to be more resistant to the vaccines. So we've got to stop it now. Um, and we really, we really do not have um, any time. I have a couple of other questions here. Um, why aren't we going back to phase one if our numbers are like they were in March? That's an absolutely fair question. Um, because we have vaccines and because we know what works. If, if our cases went up, and it was just our cases, that means that everybody's just getting a cold. So far, New Orleans, although we are seeing people hospitalized with COVID, because we're so vaccinated, the number of our residents being hospitalized are not what it is in the rest of the state. So we know that the vaccines are working. We also know that, like it or not, there is really no... Um, appetite, and this is a more of a political thing than anything else, to go back to shutdowns. I think that, you know, our mayor will always do the right thing for health, um, but it's a very different time now than it was a year and a half ago. Uh, so what we're hoping is that there will be a stronger mask requirement coming in the next couple of days for not just the schools, but everywhere. I'm really hoping. Um, that I think is the first step before we start talking about locking down. You know, in New Orleans, we have continued to have restrictions on large gatherings in particular. So we've never taken all of our restrictions off. Um, and, and I'm glad that we have it. But right now we hope and pray we do not have to do more than um, stricter mask requirements. You know, I'll tell you again, we have to do what's right for, for health just as we did then, but just want to be honest about it being very difficult to do. Um, what is happening at the hospitals? Yes, this is critical. Um, 
if you are not vaccinated, please understand that if you do become ill and need a hospital bed, there really aren't any for you. Um, and I don't mean to be, you know, to sound harsh. Be, we are now at hospitalization levels statewide that are um, almost as high as they were at our peak and might even exceed our peak. This comes on the heels of a nursing shortage that's been happening for months. So we physically do not have the same number of staff to care for patients as we did in our previous surges. And while New Orleanians might not be the one filling the hospital bed because it's coming from all over, when a COVID patient is taking up a bed in a hospital here, that means that your chest pain, your appendicitis, your broken leg has to wait hours and hours and hours to be seen. So it is really affecting us in that way. Um, our hospitals have sounded the alarm. They have been very clear talking to the governor and other leaders saying, we can't tolerate this. We need more action. Um, and that's why I'm hopeful there will be a, some new mask requirements just to give our hospitals a break. Uh, but that's a really big concern. Um, Really, if you are unvaccinated um, and, and you get COVID, there's, it's gonna be a really difficult time for you um, in the hospital. So please do your part, get vaccinated, wear your mask, don't transmit it to anyone vulnerable because um, it's, it's a pretty scary time in our hospitals. Um, children under age 12, when are they gonna get vaccinated? I wish it was tomorrow. Um, the preliminary data has been released. It's really, really good for kids. As good as the, as the vaccines are for adults, it seems like it's almost better for this age group, which is wonderful. And it, you know, it, it goes with, why do we give kids vaccines? Because their immune systems um, respond well to them and they get lots of benefits and you know, in some cases, lifelong immunity. The latest I've heard is that um, hopefully by September, the CDC committee will, as it has with all the other age groups, um, formally present the data and vote to approve them for ages five to 11. For the little ones, it's still a ways off. Um, there are trials going on now. If any of you have young children and you're interested in putting um, your little one in a trial, I, my daughter had several friends who participated in the trials. Um, they had great experiences. They're going on now, but the little, little ones, we probably won't see maybe by the end of the year, beginning of the year. Having that five, those five to 11 year olds ability to get vaccinated though is going to be tremendous and is going to get us much closer to that 80, 90, whatever percent we're, we're gonna get in New Orleans than anything else. So keep your fingers crossed um, that that's happening soon. Um, I'm trying to see. We have some more questions too, Dr. Go ahead, yeah. Why don't you just shoot yeah. and, and we'll go. Yep. So based on what you said about masks, we have some questions about the cloth mask. So are cloth masks still effective against the Delta strain of the virus or are other mask types in 95K and 95 more recommended? You know, so far, it's really that physical barrier. Um, N95s, we're still trying to reserve for healthcare personnel. Um, they are also really, really difficult to wear. Uh, you know, I'm a healthcare worker and there've been times in the hospitals where we've had to wear N95s during a 12 hour shift. It's, it's hard. And so what happens when a mask is hard to wear is that you're grabbing at it and you're pulling it off and you're, you know, rubbing your nose and it actually probably makes it worse. Um, you know, does a surgical mask confer a little bit more protection than a cloth mask? Probably, but it's probably negligible. There is, you know, there are people who like to double mask that is not a bad thing to do. Historically, the protection benefit has been minimal, but if you want a double mask, that's great. Um, I just think N95s are not really practical and I do think we need to reserve them for our healthcare workers. And yes, um, based on the data I saw yesterday from the CDC, there's still, you know, they still believe that masking is as effective against this variant as it has been in the past. We have a couple of people noting that they were waiting for full FDA approval to get the vaccine. Can you talk about why we don't yet have the approval and if that even matters right now? It really doesn't. There is absolutely no reason to wait. So 
vaccines have been given to over 3 billion, with a B, people worldwide. That's more than pretty much any other vaccine we ever give on a regular basis. In the US, the three vaccines, we've given over 300 million doses with almost no severe side effects. Certainly everybody's aware of the, the very, very rare side effects with Johnson & Johnson. And that's something that if you are you know, prone to blood clots or on birth control or smoke, you might wanna to talk to your doctor and not get Johnson & Johnson. Pfizer and Moderna are unbelievably safe. I, I can't think of a medication. So I'm an ER doctor. I prescribe medications all the time that are way more dangerous than these vaccines. Um, the EUA, that process, it is important though, right? That we go through the same process because if we didn't, people would say, oh, you're trying to rush it, you know, because it, it's some nefarious reason. So that EUA process has certain steps. The data has been submitted, the FDA has it. I do think there is a frustration that, you know, we've been able to do these steps quickly, right? Like, you know, at City Hall, normally it could take me six months to get a contract. But if I ask everybody to do the expedited process, we're still doing the same steps, but everybody is doing them, putting more attention on them quicker, right? So nobody wants to cut out any steps, but there's been a growing frustration to say, can we make this the single most priority for the FDA? Because we know that folks are waiting. We also know that um, there are many employers who are going to choose to mandate vaccinations, just as they do for lots of others. I'm a healthcare worker. The hospital tells me I got to get a flu shot every year. I got to get a hep B vaccine. So I do it. It's going to be the same for many with um, COVID vaccinations. They're waiting, you know, having that mandatory stamp of appeal is really more of a legal thing. It has absolutely nothing to do with the science. There is going to be no difference in the vaccines the day after they get full approval to what they are now. And, you know, I'll just say, we've got all the data that we need. So there's no reason to wait. Thanks. Some question about boosters. So folks wanting to know, when can we expect that in mass we'll be able to get boosters? Will those be rolled out by um, occupation or age like it was before? And then finally with boosters, if you got the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, could you switch to get the Pfizer or Moderna booster and vice versa? Yeah, that's a great question. And I suspect we're gonna have more answers in a few weeks to months on this because um, it's being actively studied. You know, Pfizer came out and said, oh, hey guys, we got a booster and it works really great against Delta. Well, of, of course, right? They, they would like for us all <laughs> to get a booster. Um, so far, the data that we have in the US shows that there are still high, high levels of immunity six to eight months after you get that second dose, really high. So a booster wouldn't do all that much. And I'll tell you, I got my, I got my Pfizer the very first day it came out because I was a healthcare worker, I was eligible and I rolled up my sleeves. Um, so it's been, that was December 14th. So it has been however many, seven, almost eight months. So even in people like me, when they're looking at the immunity levels, they're still very, very high. What we do know though, is that elderly people, people with immune compromise disorder, they have a hard time generating the most robust response anyway, because that's, that's just what happens. So what I think you're gonna see is that a booster is gonna be recommended first for those that we know probably didn't have the strongest response, even though they got the full series, because they need the, they're the ones most at risk. And then it will be opened up to the rest of us. That's, that looks to be what Israel is doing. They're, they're going to test it and see, I think, on their nursing home patients if they got a booster. Um, I do expect we're going to have boosters at some point, but I don't think for the average, healthy, fully vaccinated person, it's going to be in the very near future. And look, I will tell you, you know, like I'll, I'll get up there and say, okay, I'm getting my booster. Everybody get your booster. I'm not rushing out and getting like a secret booster. I haven't gotten like extra shots because I know it just doesn't work. In terms of the Johnson and Johnson switching to a full series, that's another question we don't have a lot of answers to. Johnson and Johnson confers really good immunity. It 
does seem to be maybe a little less overall than Pfizer and Moderna, that normally shouldn't matter. It may be that at some point we find that um, if you had Johnson and Johnson, you might benefit from a booster of one of the other ones. Um, I will say that I think in the UK, they're looking at if you got one or two and you get a third of the other, does that help? Um, maybe we'll find out it does and then that'll be the recommendations, but, but not just yet. Some questions about the vaccine construct composition itself. So if the vaccine isn't a live virus, what is it then and how does it work? Yeah, it, so you've got the Johnson & Johnson, which is a vaccine that's similar to a lot of other vaccines that have already been out there. It's, it's a modified adenovirus. So again, not a live virus, but a piece of a similar virus that tells your body, look for this. The Pfizer, Moderna are mRNA, messenger RNA. So that is, messenger RNA is the thing that tells your body what to do, tells your cell, hey, do this. So it is a tiny piece, not of the live virus, but of, of messenger RNA that is coded for the virus that when you, when you gets into your cell, it says, make a copy of this, right? Now, it does not make a copy of the virus. Your, vi your body is not then producing the virus. It is producing a mimic of the spike protein, those little spiky things you know, on the ball. And when your body makes it, it, it says, this is an invader. If you see some, you know, something that looks like this, send the troops. So your body is basically practicing, right? It's giving your body a blueprint to say, make this little thing, look at this thing and get ready when you see this thing coming because it's, you need to fight it off. When your body's immune system, just like all of us, right? When we can practice something, we get much better at it. So when your body's immune system has that warning and knows what to look for and knows how to defeat it, then when it sees it, it's like, oh, I know what this is. I'm gonna send my B cells, send my T cells and it's done. That's why what we're seeing vaccinated people who get Delta, what we're seeing is that comes in through the nose, comes in through the, the throat. When your body sees it, it stops it much, much, much earlier from making a bazillion copies. And so it says, oh, I know who you are. I'm gonna fight you. So you still, you still do have some, but when we compare it to what unvaccinated people have and their ability to spread, it's nowhere near because their body's never seen it before. Um, so their body's like, I don't know what this is. You know, I, we'll see what happens. And it's trying to do its best to fight it off but it, it has no blueprint. So we do have some folks noting that they were unvaccinated, they got COVID and are interested in the vaccine. So the question is how long after being clear of COVID can an unvaccinated person start the vaccination process? Yeah, like and that's a great point. Natural immunity, particularly if you had the original form of COVID, a lot of people did, right? I got, you got sick in March, you got sick in April. Um, you had the original form, you recovered. That immunity wanes over time. This is very, very true of other coronaviruses. So other coronaviruses are what causes the common cold, right? So you guys know you can get three colds in a season, right? Just because you get a cold once, that doesn't stop you from getting another cold six weeks later. So coronaviruses in general, do not have a whole lot of natural immunity, especially when we're talking about Delta, which really is you know, a different variant of the original. So you, you have likely less natural immunity to that. It just doesn't cut it. The good news is if you have COVID, you test COVID positive, as long as you are completing, completed your isolation period, which is 10 days, and you're back to normal, right? You don't have any symptoms, you can get it right away. So it's really 10 days out, uh, anytime after that, you can get it. I know there are some healthcare practitioners who say, oh, just get your antibody levels drawn. And when you don't have antibodies anymore, then you should get it. That is not a good way to look at it. First of all, tests for antibodies are not really good. 
Um, and they're not helpful. And just because it shows you have them, it doesn't really show how well they're working or what they're doing. So if anybody tells you that, that is not science, that's not best practice. Soon as you recover and you finish your isolation period, please go get your vaccine. Okay, great. Switching to kids um, focus a little bit. So we have some folks who are parents who are interested, some are just interested at because we will be around some kids. So how sick are kids getting, are younger kids yeah. getting, particularly kids under the age of 12 that can't be vaccinating? Because it hasn't been clear whether that kids, whether kids who are 12 to 17 are getting hospitalized or what's happening with them. So can you talk a little bit about children? Yeah. So they are like so unvaccinated 12 to 17 year olds are getting hospitalized and even dying um, as recently as the last week, uh, which is devastating because it could have been prevented. It is true of Delta as well as the you know original form that by and large kids have a, a easier course, right? For most kids, it's a sniffles, it's a cough, it's you know usual kid stuff, right? However, what we're seeing with Delta, you know, and and again even beforehand, there still were kids who got very very sick. Some of them had underlying problems, right? They had cancer, they had kidney disease, they had liver disease, et cetera. Some of them didn't. It really is a crapshoot, right? Uh, pardon my language, but it really, you don't really know, you know, probably my kid is gonna be the one who's okay, but there's that chance that your kid is gonna be that one who gets the severe outcome. We have, with Delta, we are seeing far more pediatric hospitalizations than we ever saw before. And again, even though they're unlikely and most kids are still having a mild course, it is really concerning to see those hospitalizations tick up. If I, 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 sorry, I sent a video that was done yesterday at Children's, I'm not sure if you guys all got it, but I think they said, um, you know, Children's had two cases last week and they've got 17 now, including a 23 month old. Um, and then, you know, a mix of adolescents and younger kids. So again, your kid is probably going to be okay, but that risk of having a severe outcome is ticking up. And that's why, you know, to me, that's why I wear the mask. Um, I don't have, thankfully my youngest is 12, which worked out really well, but I've got lots of folks in my office who have babies, toddlers, and I couldn't, live with myself if I was careless and it caused their child to get sick and then be one of those ones with a severe outcome. So on that same vein, folks are asking what precautions can parents take for kids under 12? They know their kid is going to go to school and that everyone's going to be wearing masks, but what else should they be doing? Um, and then the same question, but they're talking about under five-year-olds. Yeah, I, I was like the least popular mom in the world for the last year because until my kids got fully vaccinated, they didn't have sleepovers. You know, when they went to parties, they were the ones in the mask, right? Um, I think that that's how I would operate. I would really watch the activities that they're doing, um, you know, the, the kind of extracurriculars that they might be involved in, the birthday parties, indoors, the sleepovers, um, those are not a really great idea right now during the Delta surge. Hopefully when we get past this surge and the levels of transmission are low, like they were in the spring, that'll open up. And, and look, I, I know, I know kids just want to be kids. Um, and so I know it's really, really hard on them to, to not be able to, um, to do all the things that they like to do, but <sighs> Right now, in particular, at least for the next few weeks while we weather this, I think it's it's good if you have unvaccinated kids in the house to really curtail what they're doing with other unvaccinated people. How long do we anticipate this surge to last given our current efforts? This person is also noting that they know that vaccinations increased a lot in New Orleans area very recently. So what are we expecting? Yeah, but that, and that's great. And that's exactly what we want to see, but that effect is like six weeks out, right? Cause you got to get your first, then you got to get your second and then you got to wait the two weeks. Um, I don't know. That's this, that's a little alarming. Um, I, 
I'm hopeful, again, if we get a mask, a stronger masking requirement for the general public, I think that will cut it down. What we've seen in, in other outbreaks is that it's a few weeks of really high cases, the hospitalizations, and then deaths tend to lag. So I'm, I'm hopeful that this will only be a few weeks, um, but it is hard, hard to predict. Are there indoor environments we should avoid, vaccinated and unvaccinated? Yeah, I will say, you know, the only large indoor event that I would go to now is if everyone was masked the entire time and they required proof of vaccination or a negative test. Um, I mean, I, I'm kind of nerdy, so I don't go, you know, big big wild crazy parties normally. Um, but that's the only way I would go out. I really wanna commend some of our, our music venues, our performers, our clubs who have come out. And you know, I live not far from Tipitina's and I was really excited for them to say, you can't, you gotta show us proof of vaccination or negative test. Um, I would add masking to that <laughs> right now, uh, but I wouldn't be, you know, I'm still going, you know, I, I still go to church. I still go to the grocery store. Uh, I'm always wearing my mask. In fact, sometimes I'm the only one who do. And, you know, in those kind of situations, I don't need to, I don't need to get that close to anybody in the grocery store, right? I don't need to get that close to anybody in the shopping mall or a church or one of those things. So I do still think those are reasonable things to do, but anything that's crowded. Um, and, you know, I will, I will say this, anything in New Orleans, that's over 250 people and it's, they want to have more than 50% capacity of wherever the, the event is, they have to be wearing masks as it stands now. So if you like go to a wedding and there's 300 people there and they're all packed in and they're not wearing masks then they're not following the guidelines and that's not a safe place to be. Yeah. So this is a question about side effects that we're seeing now with the Delta variant and that maybe we're seeing less or more of. So we've heard about the side effects just in general that people were feeling with COVID pre-Delta variant about the smell, the taste, things that might've been lingering. Are you seeing more or less of any particular thing with the Delta variant or is it the exact same symptoms and effects? Yeah, it does seem anecdotally that Delta presents more as like allergy sinus type stuff. It does seem to take hold a lot in the nose. And whereas regular COVID, you know, initially it was that cough, that fever, that shortness of breath. Now everybody's saying, oh, my allergies are acting up. And I say, it's probably not your allergies, you know, go get tested or, you know, don't just assume that sinus, sinus headache that we all have because it's New Orleans um, is sinus. So take that seriously if you're having nasal type symptoms, because we, we're seeing that a lot with Delta. In terms of the long COVID, those folks that have the persistent symptoms, I don't think we're seeing much different yet, although it's kind of early to tell. Uh, people still are getting the smell and taste. It seems it remains to be seen how many people are going to get those long-term, you know, headaches and neurologic symptoms and fatigue. We're really not sure. Long COVID is something we don't know a lot about. We think that up to 10% of everybody who had COVID, whether you knew it or not, right? Doesn't matter how severe your case was, you develop some kind of persistent symptoms that last for a month or more, um, which is scary. And we still don't know though, how that's gonna play out over time. Some folks are asking about building immunity against the virus. And particularly we have been hearing just over the course of the last year and a half that you should take zinc, you should take vitamin C, you should do a multivitamin, you should take vitamin D. Can you help clear up like what actually helps build immunity against the virus and what do those vitamins do for us? Yeah. My husband is like the world's biggest zinc believer. Every, every time he used to get a sniffle, he would be running and getting the zinc. There actually is some, some evidence that if you take zinc early on when you have a regular old virus, that maybe it helps a little bit. And it's certainly not harmful, right? And that's the case with all vitamins. They're not harmful if you take them in recommended doses but they really don't have any intrinsic effect against this particular virus. They do not 
kill this virus. They do not cure the virus. They don't build up your immune system so that you don't need a vaccine. They're what we call adjunct therapies, just things to help you maybe feel a little bit better sooner. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I don't take any of them. I don't generally take extra vitamin C. The best way to get vitamins is through your diet. Um, I think the, the, the pharmaceutical companies that make billions of dollars every year selling you vitamins don't like it when people say that, but um, you know, I eat a pretty decent diet most of the time. And so I know I'm getting plenty of vitamin C from oranges and peaches and whatever. Uh, so I don't generally take supplements. If that's part of what you do, it, it certainly isn't harmful. Folks wondering if we can go to gyms and fitness centers if we're vaccinated. Technically, yes. Um, I would say that I am not. I had just started doing hot yoga because I needed to do something. Uh, I'm not very good at it, uh, but I was trying. Um, and I tried to do it a week or two ago when Delta started taking off in a mask and it was impossible. Um, gyms have been shown even before we had this more contagious variant to be places where vi the virus spreads quickly. Why? Because you're sweating, you're grunting, you're you know, shouting. So you're, you're expectorating particles into the air a lot easier than if you're just even sitting down at a table at a coffee shop talking to someone. Um, I don't feel safe personally exercising inside of a gym right now. I walk all the time. Outside is great. You know, and I think if you can, a lot of gyms move their classes outdoors, and I think that might be a safer option. Um, but for right now, I'm putting the pause on the gym, and it's not just because I'm I'm lazy or I don't want to do it. Um, just for everybody, thanks for all of your questions in the chat. I am, I do see them all. Some of the questions are going to be more school policy questions, so you'll you'll leave it to your um, your teams. And some folks are asking about for their spouses, they would need to go to their employers and such. So I'm just sifting through for the ones that Dr. Vegno can really lean in on. Um, so there's a question. Um, what's the recommendation for kids who are too young to wear a mask daycare? Yeah, so um, I believe the CDC recommends over two, um, it, and it is hard for, I mean, toddlers can't really wear a mask. They were successful. I think daycares were successful, and I, I hope they will do this as well when they they really used a pod system, right? So kept kept those kids and the whatever caregivers were with them in groups that did not circulate with other people as much. I think that's a good mitigation. You know, many of you know that we have had outbreaks in daycares and summer camps and that sort of thing this summer for Delta. Um, and so masking is not going to be an option. Vaccination is not going to be an option. I would not want my kids to be in daycare if their teacher were not vaccinated, um, because that's probably the, the bigger risk. Um, but I, I hope that daycares will, will continue those, you know, really small, tight groups, not sharing, you know, especially not being in indoor spaces um, with each other. And I think, you know, it's not as good as wearing a mask, but it's just not practical to have an 18 month old wear a mask for any length of time. Can you talk a little bit about the Delta virus and um, those who are pregnant or are going to be pregnant soon, if this one has any effect on it versus like regular COVID? Yeah, I would love to um, because it, it affects me personally. And unfortunately, I have some family members who have been resistant to vaccine. And now one of them is pregnant and I'm really, really, and, and has it, has the virus um, on the North Shore. And I'm really sort of agonizing, you know, I think she'll be okay. But um, what we know about the original virus in pregnant women is that if you're pregnant with the virus, you have twice the chance of a severe outcome as not being pregnant with the virus. Um, it's just, a, it, it really, the virus completely wreaks havoc on all of your systems if you get a severe case. Uh, the myth of the infertility vaccine rumor is just so devastating. It is absolutely untrue. 
100% untrue. Um, it's just a terrible, terrible rumor um, that I think has made people afraid unnecessarily. What we know is that thousands of women who have gotten vaccinated have uh, gotten pregnant successfully. Thousands and thousands of pregnant women got the vaccine while they were pregnant. Getting the vaccine while you're pregnant is actually the only way to protect your baby because what we see is that your body produces the antibodies and it transfers them to the baby. So at birth, that baby has protection that other babies don't. And so, you know, a good friend of mine just told me she was pregnant. She said, oh my gosh, I'm so glad I'm vaccinated because I'm gonna, you know, now when the baby's born, I'm not gonna be as worried about it, you know, the baby getting sick. Um, OBs are recommending vaccination. Um, please, if you are considering getting pregnant, if you are pregnant, talk to your OB, have a real conversation about it. But my OB colleagues have taken care of way too many pregnant women with COVID in the ICU with some really bad, bad outcomes. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's critical to, to do this. Um, if I were pregnant, I would take it in a heartbeat. Yep. So this is from someone where um, he and the, his spouse are both vaccinated, but the vaccinated spouse has become um, COVID positive. Should he change any of his behavior at home? Yeah, no, thanks for, um, this is a, a good time to talk about when that happens. So again, I hope he's doing okay. Hopefully he should have, uh, or, or he or she, sorry, I, I don't know who the spouse is. Um, it should have a mild course because you are their close contact, right? What the new recommendation is, is that you get tested immediately. So my spouse turns up positive, I'm vaccinated, they're vaccinated, I go get a test immediately. Doesn't matter what kind of test, right? Wherever you can get the test, get the test. If I'm negative, because I'm vaccinated, I'm more protected. I can continue to do my thing. I don't need to quarantine, but I'm gonna get another test in about a week, just to make sure. If I'm unvaccinated and I'm exposed to my spouse who's positive, I got to quarantine for the 10, 14 days. No, no questions, no tests, no nothing. So being vaccinated does prefer, confer enough immunity that you can test several times but still return to work. And I'll give you an example. One of my colleagues, her, her five-year-old tested positive, got it from the, the summer camp. He was with her and her parents, all three of them are fully vaccinated. They were together, you know, for two weeks in the same house. All three of the unvaccinated, all three of the vaccinated adults had multiple negative tests. Doesn't happen to everybody, right? Um, but it just shows you that being vaccinated is still less likely you're going to get it as well. So test now, test in a week. Got it. And then just because some folks did join after um, to sort of close out our questions, could you quantify, if, is it possible to quantify the spread of this uh, virus right now by unvaccinated versus vaccinated people and help us understand once again why uh, we should be vaccinated? Yeah, that is a, a great question. And it's hard. What we can do best is say that 90% or more of hospitalized COVID patients are unvaccinated. When we look at who's catching it now, right? Most, most people are not ending up in a hospital. So it's probably likely that more than 10% of vaccinated people, you know, of, of all the cases right now, probably more than 10% of them are vaccinated people. They're just getting really, really, really mild cases or no symptoms at all. Um, so this is a pandemic that starts and ends in the unvaccinated people. That's why it exploded. It is spilling over into the vaccinated population, but the vaccines are doing exactly what they were designed to do and prevent us all from ending up in the hospital. Um, if more people don't get vaccinated and this thing continues to burn through, then unfortunately it's going to continue to spill over into vaccinated folks. But you know, 90% of severe disease. My guess is that probably if we looked at all cases, 
75 to 80 percent of them would be unvaccinated. Um, but it's it's hard to get good numbers on that. That's just sort of my guess. Thanks a lot. So what I'm dropping in the chat, everyone, is just the link that Dr. Avegno talked about to the story she saw about children and COVID-19. She sent that to us. So I'm going to put it in the chat for you. It's just a YouTube link if you want to just copy it to watch it at a different time. I know folks are going to be going off to other sessions and getting ready for the first day next Monday. Um, James has also dropped into the chat um, places where you can go get vaccinated, some of them including today but um, he has all the information there. Of course, you can always reach out to us and your leadership teams if you have any questions, just so that those two things can stay relevant, can stay most recent in the chat. Um, please don't drop anything else in the chat right now so everyone can see it. Oh, actually it's not showing for everyone, so that's fine. But um, if you wanna just come off mute since Dr. Vegno can't see it, if we could just give a big thank you to her um, for doing this with us today. If you could just give a, a big shout out, we really are appreciative of that. Just come off mute. Say thank you and then have a great um, rest of your afternoon and good luck um, and stay safe next uh, week with kids. Thank you. Happy to be here. Good luck, everybody. Thanks a lot.